my dear sons. As time passes, you were after all small boys then. I write these memories so our story will not be forgotten. This is not the story of our family alone. It is the story of millions during the war. And millions more who suffer such hardship and sorrow this very moment. Fortunately, my dad took the time to write three books. The first he called at the lowest level, three and a half years in the Soviet Union. Papi says to George, you were during the most difficult years of our lives, always of great help and comfort to us. This book contains a part of your life at a time when boys of your age are playful and carefree you knew already the seriousness of life and even hunger. May these memoirs be an inspiration to you in the future so that our suffering should not have been in vain. I would consider us upper middle class. My father got a PhD in University of Vienna when Freud was just a young guy with an idea. You know, that was the era. We had a paint factory in Krakow. There were professional people and there were business people. And then the war began. We left our home in Krakow for the family home in Lwów. Millions of refugees were fleeing the Nazis in the West. German bombers were gunning civilians on the roads, families scattered, children separated from parents, husbands from wives. After 15 days and nights of hell, the Soviet army marched in. And we found ourselves in a place suddenly quiet and peaceful. No one knew the Soviets' intention. Some greeted them with bread and salt, a Polish tradition of welcoming friends. People hidden for days in cellars came into daylight. The Red Army told everyone willing to listen about Soviet Russia, the land of opportunity, with Stalin as their great leader. But soon people learned to be careful about their backgrounds, their education, and their work. Lives depended on it. Then it was first there was registration. You had to go and register by profession, so if you married a single, and and it was noticed that some of these people who had registered for whatever category were disappearing. So people wouldn't spend the nights in the in the home. They would kind of go someplace else. So if the knock on the door came, they could they wouldn't be there. Most men lost their heads and their nerves, lost everything, possessions, businesses, land, hounded by the Russians for their social standing. And the women took over, managed their family affairs, kept the family alive.
Then the Russians lifted their masks, pretended no longer. The silence was broken by screams, a human roundup, quick and efficient. We were awake, knowing what to expect. Sometime after midnight, a heavy knock on the door. Four men in uniform entered our home, declared us under arrest. My mother said, can you tell us where we're going to be going? And well, the, the Russians are very good at what we call big lies. You know? Oh, don't worry, it's going to be a great job, or whatever it is that they, they, they would tell us, don't worry, you have your whatever. So when she asked him, well, where are we going on this trip? He said, I can't, he wouldn't tell her, but he, but he gave her a drop to him. He said, take warm things, take things, whatever. I lost myself completely. I slipped into the bathroom with a razor in my hand, ready to cut my wrists. If I was gone, perhaps the Soviets would let you go. But if not, how much greater your suffering would be. and a smile on her face and calmly started to pack. But when you saw the strange faces of the men in uniform, you started to cry. Mother told you we were going on a long and exciting trip where you would meet many nice children to play games with. It was almost dawn when they came to take us. It was a sickening sight in the streets, everyone frightened and crying, like witnessing one's own funeral. People looked at us with eyes wide open, horrified, Others peered from open windows, wondering if they would meet the same fate the following night. We noticed our friends, the Zuzmans, in a wagon beside us with their six-year-old daughter Irenka. We begged the guards to stop and let their family board our truck. I remember that. And uh, they lifted me up on the truck. My parents got up. And there were already other people sitting in there. And we took off. It was like middle of the night, not knowing really where we were going. I must have been close to six. And I had a doll that, for some reason, I couldn't take with me. They were not prepared. They're uncovered. They, I didn't tell them to take warm things. So Mrs. Zussman had a summery dress. She had white high heels. You know, it was... And then we were unloaded at the train station. And I remember climbing into this, or they, they lifted me too, onto this uh, um, open kind of uh, car. Uh, it wasn't a regular uh, train, train car. <laughs> it was one of those, uh, you know, the transporting animals or something, yeah. At the train station, I do remember there were a lot of people, a lot of people, and people trying to find each other and, and bringing things and crying. The guy who was responsible for us, he 
Maybe he took a liking to my mother. And he was the first to open the, the sliding door of the train. And before anybody else came in, he took the, my family and Irenka's family. There were three, and we were four. And the cattle trains have a loggia that comes down where the hay gets put up so that the, the cattle eat hay at eye level. Not, they don't, but... <laughs> And he, and he put us up there in, in that space. And the, the thing about th that space is that at the end, there's a tiny little window. Uh, so we had the window. And then I remember the other people coming onto the train and trying to find space. I have a vague memory. The two boys on both sides of me, I think, uh, on that platform in, in, in that car. And then, you know, we took off. Um, there was no toilet, obviously. <laughs> there was a hole in, in the floor of the car. And uh, when people had to go, people would stand with like, sheets or towels, whatever they had, to, for, for, for a certain amount of privacy. <sighs> I don't know, I suddenly feel like I'm going to cry. <laughs> I haven't talked about it for a long time. Suddenly, the train moved with a sharp pull. The rhythm of the wheels and the sound of the engine was somehow soothing to our nerves. We tried to guess where we were headed and what would be our fate. The train would often change tracks and some people would get out when the train stopped to get some hot water and bring it onto the, the train. And, uh, and they would, the train would leave and they would somehow stay behind. Well, my father got off the train and the train started changing tracks. And I thought that the, basically that uh, the train was leaving and I would never see my father again. And I was hysterical. That I remember very well. And Mrs. Landau, George's mother, uh, my mother didn't know what to do with me. And uh, Mrs. Landau hit me in the face. <laughs> that was the way of <laughs> dealing with hysteria then, which I think worked. It really did work. So uh, I, I quite doubted then my father eventually. Somehow the train went back and got him. And he got in the train. The train was two weeks and then boat for a couple of days and from there there were some trucks that eventually took us to our quote <laughs> home in Pojawek Nyaris. That's this village where we stayed for a year and a half. The settlement was a natural prison of small, decrepit huts, inaccessible woods. A friend ran to meet us, desperate and weeping. He told us this place is not meant for human beings. Nothing is here to keep humans alive, only to destroy them. We finally found some dilapidated cabin. Ours lacked windows and doors, and the door 
and the mosquitoes knew that. So, I mean, when you see a swarm coming at you and, and they're not birds, they're mosquitoes. I think if God ever made a mistake, mosquitoes were certainly one of them. If he made more than one mistake. They took the men away to camp. Uh, and the men went there to cut trees and whatever they were supposed to do. And women and children stayed behind. To leave our families in this wilderness with no protection and to be sent away to who knows where and for how long was like a second deportation, but even more tragic. Each day before the sun rose, we were marched into the woods, no trace of human life along the way, cutting tall trees in deep snow until we could barely stand. Shoes stuffed with newspaper, hands frozen stiff, stopping only to eat a small slice of bread tucked inside our shirts to keep it from freezing. In the case of my dad, as others, this was wood cutting part of Siberia. That's where the slave labor was used to cut down immense trees with two men saws, no equipment, and axes, and virtually no equipment for that coal. And then, then winter came. <laughs> and uh, that, was, that was difficult. Um, cold, of course. Uh, <laughs> Nothing was heated, <laughs> so um, the water, we had water in the bucket and that would freeze overnight. And then in the morning, my mother and I would get out and get cut wood and start the fire and defrost the water. <laughs> so we worked. Afraid and exhausted, every moment was a bid for survival with ever-dimming hopes of seeing our families again. People did what they could to survive, and spies were everywhere among us. We could trust no one, not even those we called friends. We were told again and again to forget our past, here in the woods was our future, and our children's future as well. We were still children, so there were times where we were children. <laughs> and this was a little bear, he's missing a leg, and this was a little horse, <laughs> kind of a horse. And I would play with them for hours at a time, and one day, for my birthday actually, this boy whittled me a train, and when it's cold, you tend to stay in bed as long as you can. And I would make kind of mountains with my knees and those things, and then I would use the train to slide up and down the mountains. Chopping wood, hauling water, standing in line for bread, Often, you sat listening to the problems and worries of the older folks. The look in your eyes too serious for any child. We knew what to do without being told what to do. We knew that Walsh had ears, that Russians encouraged children to denounce their parents. It just happens that there is, there is danger out there. You just don't know what can happen to you. And, and, and you're helpless. But then you kind of find that, that strength. No, you're not helpless. <laughs> you can do something about certain things, not everything. Yeah. Uh, but I think it was illnesses. I mean, my, my parents... Uh, had malaria, 
So they would get these malaria attacks where people shake and have very high fever and and then it breaks and, and it's it's scary to a child. It was scary for me. I always felt that I may lose my parents. There was among us a pious man with a beautiful voice, an Orthodox Jew who lived for months on dry bread and water. On Yom Kippur, we pray for forgiveness, for life, not death, for health, not sickness in the coming year. The beautiful melody sounded so sad and heartbreaking among our little group, so tired and hungry. It seemed at that moment we belonged already to another world, where it makes no difference how you praise God by a traditional Hebrew prayer or a hallelujah by Mozart. I was never so close to God as then. Our pious man was given four months of hard labor for his prayers on Yom Kippur. He came back broken, mentally and physically, and died shortly thereafter. After ten months in the forest, I was at the end of my strength. My legs were swollen, and I could no longer work. Finally, allowed to return to my family, I walked day and night, 70 miles through deep snow and dense forest. When I neared the village, people ran to me asking about their loved ones. It was like coming from a battlefront, reporting about those left behind. I returned on your mother's birthday. No gift in hand, no cake. But we were together again. The way we got out of Russia, I consider that a miracle also. Because uh, it was a history, it was a quirk in history. When the Germans attacked the Russians, the Polish bourgeoisie, the people that were deported, were no longer considered in that same light. We were, in a sense, quote, allies of some sort. So we were liberated, as it were, but everybody agreed, except for some elderly people that were just too tired, they decided to stay in Siberia. Even Papi at one time, I think, deep down thought that Maybe we should stay, but this Russian whom he befriended basically said to him, if the jailer opens up the jail, you go. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we went. It was a long, 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 long journey to Uzbekistan where we just came in with no permission. You know, at, kind of like illegal aliens. It took quite a long time, the trip. You know, it was by boat, by train. I remember being sick a lot and, and lying in the, and, uh, at the uh, train station just on the floor for nights. And in fact, I do remember that the Russian family came over and saw me, and uh, they took us to their house and gave me their bed, and we were able to stay with them. They were just strangers who took us to their home. And uh, yeah, things like that happened too, which is amazing. This summer when you would hear about the refugees capsizing from Libya or wherever they were sailing from on these dinghies, I really felt for them because our 
boat could have capsized on a number of occasions. And it, the Caspian Sea is really rough at certain times of the year, and that was the time of the year. <laughs> so what happened was, with everybody being seasick, at least you don't crave food. Our spirits were high, despite the difficult journey. After the misery of living in the streets, Uzbekistan promised food, warmth and safety. We found some hole of a place, an abandoned chicken coop on the roof next to an open latrine, a place to lay down our heads and protect our children from the cold. The room had a stove and uh, two benches and a table. So the sleeping arrangements were Henry and I were on one bench. I think Irenka and her mother were on another bench. <laughs> and uh, uh, how was it? Mommy was on the suitcases. Oh, and Papi and Bunya were in this alcove on the floor. There was little work, if any. There, among thousands of refugees, all desperate to feed their families. So we sold what we could at the market. My worn shoes, Etta's old coat. Somehow we went on living. Endless bread lines, standing through the night, pressed between hungry and desperate people often returning empty-handed, taking home only the dreaded lice that carries typhus fever. Before long, we were starving, waking and falling to sleep with a hunger so extreme, you feel you could eat stones, anything, just to fill the emptiness in your stomach. Etta often pretended she was not hungry, and she gave her small portion of bread to the boys. We had chores, my brother and I. Sometimes they were kind of kooky, walking by a fence and waiting for a whistle, and then we'd look up and a package of, of, uh, of uh, uh, turtle, turtle livers would come flying, and we would take it, and that was a meal for a few days. Or, or some grapes would come over the, over the wall because our respective fathers were working in, in either a turtle meat factory or a wine-making establishment. I was sickened by the work of killing turtles, but the meat and eggs kept my family alive. We hid the small tins in our pockets filled with turtle remains and passed them through the holes in the factory wall to the boys waiting outside. I beg forgiveness, my sons, even now, for using you as accomplices in this plot. It was the only way I knew to survive. We were all hungry, right? And uh, there was a family that my parents met who had three children, and they were really starving. My, parent, my father took off his wedding ring, his golden wedding ring, and gave it to them and said, we still have my mother's wedding ring, so we're okay. Take the wedding ring, go sell it, get food. One day, Etta found an extra shirt of our son, George. I took the tiny shirt to the bazaar. Every time someone came up to look at the shirt and touch it, it hurt. I knew I could never buy another shirt in this land. You waited for me at the door. 
When you saw I was empty-handed, you ran to mommy, bringing with joy the good news. Papi sold my shirt. You knew it meant bread for a few days. In a situation so helpless, unexpected help sometimes came. A letter arrived from a young man whom Etta helped when he was sick with typhus. In the envelope was a generous gift of money, a few spoonfuls of soup for a poor sick boy repaid with such abundance. After all, men are good. A journey full of miracles. I mean, there wasn't, there was just one miracle after another. The way my mother found her brother in, in the bazaar in, in Bukhara, that was clearly miraculous. Those were unusual times, and unusual things happened. Etta was at the market, a place she rarely went, when some soldiers passed by. One young man turned and ran to Etta with shouts of joy. It was her brother, Runik, separated from us for years. A moment earlier or later, and they may never have met again. That a brother should find his sister in this vast mass of land among millions of wandering people is a miracle indeed. The miracle that got us out was my aunt, through her good offices of knowing this Polish diplomat, got us an exit visa to Australia through Persia. On the 16th of December, 1943, the greatest of all miracles happened. Our family was given permission to leave the Soviet Union. We, we couldn't tell people, yeah, we're leaving, hey, psst, we're leaving, <laughs> but don't tell anybody. So there was a whole ruse created about how how Papi got, couldn't get employment, so he was going to go to another town to seek employment, and we all left. And then once there, there was tremendous tension before we could get on the train. Tremendous, I remember that. We kept running with our belongings, and, and no porter would take us, I mean, in. Oh, no, 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 yet, 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 yet. And finally, the last train, Papi had some cash that Irenka's father gave him, and, and he stuck the entire cash into the palm of this woman. And as the train was moving, we were still getting some things through the windows, and, and the person that came and, uh, to help with this ticket business, it was a friend of, of Irenka's father's, um, he, he got a bread for us. And, uh, we consumed that bread, but when Mommy saw a person looking at, at her, she gave him a piece of bread, and he hadn't eaten for days. We hadn't eaten for a day and a half, but he hadn't eaten. On the 18th of December, at 30 degrees below zero, we crossed the Caucasia Mountains to Persia. 8,000 feet high on a snow-capped peak. Ten yards from the Soviet border, we said our prayers to thank our God for the greatest miracle of all. I attribute it to a miracle, and I'm, and I'm, I'm forever asking myself, well, what what am I expected to do? <laughs> I obviously I'm supposed to give back, <laughs> yeah. and uh, and all. And as it turns out, the various businesses that I've been involved in over, over the last what sixty years or more have been in in service in some kind of service. So 
I, I don't think I've met the, the market, but, <laughs> but at least I, I have an idea of uh, what, what my role should be. Our family, as Yurenko's family, was able to uh, survive without giving up our, our personal ideals. So I could look anybody in the face and not feel guilty. But. You know, I do believe that basically human beings are good. Are, are good. I, I really do believe that, that there's a kind of basic goodness in human beings that gets ruined somehow. And, you know, the millions of ways that is possible. And it does happen. Having survived with literally nothing, I don't take anything for granted, particularly our freedom. Knowing that I can go in the kitchen and get something to eat, a piece of bread. There are billions of people in the world that can't make that statement. And I do have a, a daily kind of litany of thankfulness and think about people, most of whom who are not here. To my sons, it is it has been always in my mind to write down our experiences of the war. I don't think I can do it. Um, you know, at Passover, I have Irenka here, and, and so <laughs> I usually say something about her father, and, and uh, she gets emotional, so do I. I always consider ourselves very lucky, so I don't need to cry because we escaped, and my whole family, and uh, a lot of, I think, George's family, um, got killed. So uh, I, I know I would not have survived if we had stayed in Poland. I mean, I'm sure of that. And underneath my parents' tombstones, it says they saved their family with their ideals. So we were raised that way. This book shall be a living monument for the thousands of graves of people who came here not of their own will and died here before their time, far away from their home and their families. May this book be a prayer that those times shall never come to pass anymore. <laughs>